Hey guys, I'm just uh, doing an interview here with David Stewart. He's a video journalist. He used to work for the Australian Broadcast Corporation. He sort of gave that up and started on his freelance career. He's currently living in Japan with his wife and kids. And he's going to talk to us about how he developed his freelance career, the things that he learned, some of the pitfalls he had to come uh, overcome. And so sit back and enjoy. And I hope you really... I hope you really get a lot from it because he's a, he's a very talented man. Thanks very much. Okay, David, so could tell us a little bit about uh, this new format for living and what the experience has been like for you. Okay, the new format for living, okay, as the name implies, it's a different way of living. Um, for the past, I guess, nine years or so, I'd been full-time journalist. So I'd been working in a few places. The newspaper where we met on the Tweed Coast and then I went to the group, uh, APN group, and worked online there. And then I transferred across to the ABC. And so I loved all those jobs. But just being full-time, I didn't have a lot of time to, um, A, spend with my kids, B, also chase a lot of these uh, passion projects that I love to work on. And so my wife and I, um, for a long time, we both loved travel. And we'd been talking about doing this travel where it wasn't just a quick, you know, four week trip somewhere, but it was actually a long term, slow travel. We were planning on doing that for a while, but then it took me a long time to get into journalism. And uh, I think from the moment it came as an idea in my head till the moment I got my first paycheck, it was about a seven year gap. And so that pushed things back a fair bit. And then we decided also to start a family. And so that also pushed things back a bit as well. So we kept talking about this idea to travel and um, being a journalist, I thought it would be ideal because, um, you know, there are stories all over the world. So, um, you know, it, it was really perfect for me. And the only thing was, though, I love my job so much. That was one thing that was kind of stopping me. I was like, oh, I'd have to walk away from this job at the ABC that I worked so hard to get. So mm -hmm. that was probably the hardest thing. But the new format for living basically was taking the kids out of school. Uh, we sold our house. Um quit our dream jobs and walked out into the unknown basically. And, mm. um, I had no idea at that point how I was actually going to make a living, but I knew I had these skills and I'd had chats with you as well. And you were kind of encouraging me to just go and try it. Mm. Mm. Um, but you know, up until now I've been a full-time journalist where, you know, I'd pitch stories and things, but it was also, if I didn't pitch anything, there would be someone giving me directions on what to do on that day. Whereas now I'm the one in the driver's seat making all those decisions, what stories to pursue, what offers to take up, who to have conversations with and everything. So it is a completely new way of life. Mm. And you're saying uh, about the conversations then, um, who yeah. to have conversation with, where to get the, I think that's one of the biggest challenges freelancers have got is finding those stories. What, how, what sort of weight do you put on the relationships you developed with, with contacts towards, towards achieving towards getting projects up and running? Yeah, well, I was kind of aware of this before I left the ABC as well and I wanted to kind of leverage that. So I made sure that while I was still there, I had a few conversations with people, people that I didn't kind of know personally because I knew those people I had a personal connection with I could go back to at any time. But there were kind of people on the periphery as well who I thought, okay, while I've still got the ABC email and everything, I'll just send a few emails off and let them know what I'm doing. And so one of those emails was to uh, the head of the group, uh, the ABC Life, which is the lifestyle uh, arm of the ABC, which has just been started in the last year or two. And so I kind of mentioned what we're doing, but I was actually reaching out with the idea to say, hey, I'll be traveling around the world. And I know you've got a travel section, you've got a family section. So I think, you know, maybe I could do an update on the road once that well there, but, you know, I just wanted to kind of set that up relationship so i was able just to pitch when i came up with something but he actually was more interested in this specific uh trip so he was like yeah well of course you can pitch anytime but this trip you're doing sounds really interesting you know taking your kids out of school and uh most there are a lot of backpackers but they often do that as a gap year or you mm -hmm. know once they finish uni or something and so that aspect of it being a family around the world trip i guess uh really appealed to them so they said why don't you pitch it as a uh as a series and mm -hmm. so I was like, oh, absolutely, I'll do that. Like, this sounds like a dream, being able to do travel journalism, and, yeah. you know, something ongoing as well that has a, 
you know, um, episodic kind of nature. And so I decided, well, it wasn't really a hard decision. Of course, I was going to do it. So he said, why don't you send in a pilot? A pilot was commissioned. So basically, I had the first episode to create. And based on that, so it was a paid gig, but based on that, they would decide whether or not they would go ahead with the series. Mm. So it was important that I got that right. So, um, yeah, it was kind of agreed that I'd do a package of, say, five to six minute video with 800 words. Mm. Mm. And um, yeah, that's, um, that's interesting what you're saying about that. Like, um, you're obviously a talented video journalist, but what happened? with the start in newspapers and working under editors and also digital you're doing a lot of digital as well i believe um yeah how does that help you secure work is it um yeah good question i think like so many of the jobs i've done in the past year um to to, to be honest with you like i was expecting to be doing a lot more chasing of work mm. but because of these relationships I've built over the last few years with these people within the industry, um, I haven't really had to chase any work at all yet. Like I've done a few pitches to like cold pitches to um, editors, but mm. the majority of my work has been people who kind of know what I'm doing and say, Hey, you're um, looking for freelance work now, aren't you? Um, mm. We need someone to do this video for us or it's an editing job or something simple subtitling, even just putting subtitles on videos or something like that. Um, and these have all come to me just because of existing, uh, connections. So mm. those connections really do help. So if I was more proactive, I'm sure I could be completely drowning in work as well, if I really wanted to. But for me, part of the appeal of this was also to take a little bit of a break and really spend some time just chasing those kind of stories that really mean something to me. Mm. Um, mm. I think as a journalist as well, I've grown by doing stories that I really don't have any interest in as well. Um, just because, you know, I've been assigned a job, uh, do a story on this and it's something that has some impact and people are affected by these things. It doesn't mean I have an interest in them, but I think there's still value in that. Ooh, the power just went out. Hey mate, sorry about that. What happened? The power went off. It just cut. So uh, it's never gone off before. But it just... what? <laughs> yeah. What are the what are the, uh, so I, what are the I, obstacles I, freelancing? Yeah. <laughs> so should we? Do you remember what I was talking about just now? That was good, actually. You were doing really well. Okay, let's try to get back into it. What was the actual? You were talking about um, not having to pitch. Yep. Because um, of your current contacts but oh no that's right you said you had taken it it suits your lifestyle anyway because you didn't want to be flooded with work yes okay um, for so long that's right. yeah and, and yeah so, okay so i'll start there so um dave what's the um what's some of the challenges or some of the things you learned from doing this series with the abc it's um are you did it did six episodes is that right eight episodes eight eight episodes yep yeah there were actually yeah, eight episodes and a couple of extra special ones. Like I did some extra ones for like, um, just for social media and stuff to share there as well. Oh, yeah. But yeah, one of the interesting things was, was, I guess, um, I would do the first draft and send it into, um, Sydney, uh, and then they would watch it and they would come back to me with suggestions. And so that was a really interesting part of the process that I hadn't really dealt with before because most of my editors had been on site. So it was just a matter of um, calling them over to my desk and showing them what I produced and if there were. Also, because I've been doing video journalism, but also in these places I've been, uh, I'm not really amongst people who also have worked in video. So when I was at APN, for example, I was basically, you know this from uh, your experience, I was the entire team, basically video team. There was one person in the video team. And so I didn't really have peers or a superior who could say, Hey, um, you know, the way you cut that video was a bit strange. Maybe you could try this. It was, uh, quite easy to impress people because they didn't have a background in video. Um, basically anything I did, they go, Oh, wow, that looks fancy. Mm. Um, but this was good because I, uh, it was a little bit different at the ABC because there were, I had especially colleagues. So I was part of a team who also we could kind of, uh, it was almost like a peer reviewed system. 
where we'd look at each other's work, but not so much our superiors. Um, but in this case, I would actually send them in and uh, the person looking at them had a background in television. And so she was really able to provide really good uh, critical feedback that yeah. I think really helped make it a lot more of a polished product in the end. Um, but because of different time zones and things like that, I would often be sending them in, you know, at the time. And then maybe she wasn't in the office when that was sent out. And so sometimes it'd be a delay of a day or two and just being busy, you know, um, people's, uh, they've often got other projects they're working on. So, uh, maybe it was the last thing of the day to check my video. And then by the time it got back to me, I was sleeping. And so I'd wake up and then check them. So there was a bit of a delay just because of the time zones. This is when I was in Europe. Um, but she was really good. And this is something that's a, a skill that's in high demand, but sadly not so uh, uh, ubiquitous today. She was really good at giving really specific uh, instructions, but also she would so give me a time code. And so, you know, at one minute, 10 seconds in, you've got this. Uh, how about if you do it more like this? And she was able to do that in a concise, really clear way. And um, I found that really helpful. And all of those suggestions really did help uh, make it into a much more, uh, you know, well-polished, punchy product in the end. You do have to lose your ego a bit when you're freelancing. Cause, oh, uh, absolutely, yeah. I, I, had, um, I had the same experience with the recent job I've done. I'm on my fourth free write, along yeah. with um, uh, doing all the... Um, all the referencing and fact checking done it's a tedious process but it's um you know you're right it is a it is a skill that um i don't have yeah. so it's good to have someone like that who has that skill in my corner absolutely yeah and, and uh um it's always it's always come from the right place so mm. yeah you can't sort of just throw your hands up in the air and get upset about and also each, you know, there's a house style for each place as well. So um, just getting my head around their house style and it was good because they had a style guide, for example. So um, there were certain colors that they liked if they were used in a background or something like that. If I was going to do motion graphics, which I did, I would be sure to incorporate these kind of colors that were part of the schemes that they used. Mm. And they were extremely detailed, like um, graphic designers will know this, but most colors, well, all colors will have a um, actual a value that you can kind of uh, type into a little box and you'll get that exact color. And so um, yeah. they provide them. So it's very easy just to put them in and make, uh, if there's text on screen, I'll make sure it's got those colors and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and as long as they only have house once, it's fine. It's when that's repeated. <laughs> yeah. Or that's a problem. And that's exactly what um, I tried to avoid happening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So mate, you've done this, um, the new format, for living um, for a while now, and you're in Japan yeah. currently, but you've uh, done quite a bit of work. How long have you been traveling so far, and what yeah. what sort of projects have you been working on? Yeah, so I left my job at the ABC in February last year, and it's May now, so that's yeah, a year and three months. Um, and yeah, so the new format for living, the series has, uh, has now ended. Um, it was getting to a point as well, eight series I think was just right. We also, um, we were planning to still be traveling, but of course there's Corona and my wife is also pregnant as well. So we've decided, uh, she's Japanese. So we thought Japan's still a little bit like traveling, but mm. it's, it's also familiar enough that, um, you know, we can, uh, settle down here for a little bit and, um, have the third child. And you're fluent in Japanese as well. So yeah, I mean, I've lived in, in Japan for, I think six years in total over a few different trips. Mm. So you can tell us your own stories in Oh, Japan. yeah. And I mean, there are so many great stories here. Like um, I found one, uh, and these are ones as well. I, I've, I've been chasing stories before I even try to pit, pitch them to somebody. I just think even if I can't sell this, I will just uh, put it on my own YouTube channel or whatever. So like mm -hmm. I've done some like that where uh, I did one, there's a guy, when we go to my in-law's house, there's a public bathhouse near their house that I often go and visit. And so after my bath, I'll t I was talking to the manager and he was telling me that in his 15 years that the number of bathhouses in the local area, because they have like an association, it had halved in 15 years. And he said, you know, people just aren't coming to these bathhouses like they used to. That's because they've got baths in their houses, but also, um, 
yeah, people don't really, they go online to find that sense of community or anything. They don't go and talk to the local neighbors or whatever like that. And so I said, Ooh, this is really interesting. Like, and I asked him, I wasn't sure if he'd be up for it. And I said, would you be okay if I kind of followed you around for a day and interviewed you for a video? And, um, he, he was, yeah, sure. And so I just said, I've got this, uh, person who's keen to let me follow them around, which is kind of often the main, um, hurdle in getting this, you know, like normally it's the other way around. You're chasing someone, looking for someone and then trying to find them getting knocked back. And so I just said, I'm just going to shoot first and then figure out what to do with it afterwards. And as it happened, I didn't edit it for about a year because I was busy with all these other things. Mm. Um, but still, at least I feel it's something that it's on my YouTube channel. Um, I'll be able to use that when I, uh, approach other people and say, Hey, I was thinking of producing a little feature like this. Would you be happy to, uh, let me follow you around? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes getting that story is as simple as, um, asking the question or picking up the phone. Hey, like, Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, you can't let opportunity go by like that. So, and I really enjoy finding those people who haven't really, you know, when they're really comfortable with media and they've got well-rehearsed lines in their head, it's not quite as interesting. But when you meet these people who haven't really talked to um, journalists before and they're just speaking in a very natural, off-the-cuff kind of way, mm -hmm. that's, there's something pure and beautiful about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So where can people So where can people find you, Dave? Where can they uh, keep track of your comings and goings? Yeah, you can find me on uh, Twitter. I'm Big Camo, uh, Instagram as well. I've got a homepage, uh, homepage, that sounds like something from the 1990s, I've got a site, <laughs> uh, ddsmedia.com.au. And I'm also Big Camo on YouTube. Hope you enjoyed that. That was David Stewart. I've got all his details in the link description below. And I'll be doing a couple of these videos with people. So uh, just keep, just subscribe to the channel and uh, get updates of when I, uh, I interview new freelancers and different freelancers. And I'll try to bring in freelancers that bring a, lot of, bring a lot to the conversation and to the channel. Thanks very much, bye.